And welcome to all those in attendance as well as those who are streaming and with us uh, remotely. We'd like this morning to go ahead and join our hearts and our minds together and focus our minds and thoughts on worshiping God our Father. In Psalms 118 we read, I thank you that you have answered me and you've become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Our first song will be Behold Our God. No. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has
prayer. Let's all go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, holy and awesome is your name. Come to you this day as a day of remembrance to give you all the praise, honor, and glory that you deserve. Dear God, we are thankful for the ability to come here to freely worship you here in this country. Although we may not be able to all gather here at this building together at this time, may we all do our part and worship you as you have called us to do. Dear God, we live in a time when there is a lot of uncertainty around us. Worry, fear, anxiety, whatever our concern may be, may we all do our best to put all that aside for you, God, are certain. You have always been there for us and continue to be there for us. May we always look to you for help, strength, and guidance as we go throughout this life. Although we may get distracted at times, may we always remember the, our ultimate goal in life, and that's to live a Christian life and ultimately strive to reach heaven where we will spend eternity with you. Dear God, we are thankful for this church family that we have here, that we are able to edify and build up one another. We're thankful for both the elders and the deacons and their leadership of this church and the inspired word of the Bible that you have given us to read, study from, and ultimately draw closer to you. Dear God, please be with us as we go through the rest of this service. May everything that is said and done here this morning be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song will be Hide Me Rock of Ages. Do me so. Okay. Do me so. Oh.
I lift your name on high. And oh me. Lord, I lift your name. Before the Lord's Supper will be, were you there? <clears throat> it's kind of a low, lower tone song, so. Do me so.
The text we'll be looking at this morning is from Luke chapter 20. When you look at the context of this section, Jesus is confronted by the chief priests and the scribes as he's preaching the gospel message. They challenge him with this question, by what authority are you doing these things? After pointing out their hypocrisy with a question of his own, Jesus relates a parable, a parable of the vine dresser. And as he makes this application of the vine dresser to these same chiefs and priests, he points out to them that God will destroy the vine dresser and give the vineyard to others. They understand what he's talking about. They reply back to him with indignation, which lead Jesus to actually bring these words to us, beginning of verse 17. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus quotes from Psalms 118, verse 22. This chief cornerstone was pivotal piece of the foundation, specifically carved and shaped to be this critical, for its critical purpose. It established a guide for every other stone that would be laid down. Later, the apostles in Acts 4 are proclaiming Jesus and the good news about his resurrection to the very same types of people, the leading chiefs, priests, and scribes. And he teaches them and tells, they, he teaches them, they teach and tell them about the priest, I mean about Jesus and him crucified and resurrected. Peter and John reference this same verse, just as Jesus did. But yet they go on to tell something more about the verse as it applies to Jesus. In verse 11 of chapter 4, we read, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Praise God that we have this cornerstone laid for us to serve as our firm foundation. May we always be provoked in equal measure with thanksgiving and devotion by the knowledge and remembrance of his sacrifice. As Psalms 18 sa 118 says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us now give thanks for the bread. O oh, Holy Father, we come to you now, Father, recognizing the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. The sacrifice that gives us the opportunity to come into a relationship with you once again. Father, we know the difficult, the challenge, the amount of pain and agony that went into this as Jesus gave his life freely for us. Father, may we reflect upon these things in the way we live our lives and our devotion that we share to you, Father. May we reflect upon the sacrifice, the body that was given in our stead. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you so much for the sacrifice. Please, Father, be with us as we partake of this bread and help us to remember these things as we glorify your name and that of your Son. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Let us now give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Holy, Holy Father, we approach you 
thanking you, Father, for the blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Father, we know that as we partake of this emblem, which brings to remembrance that blood, that we do so recognizing that all that we have is because of you. Father, for the things you've provided for us here in this life, but more importantly, Father, the things you've set up for us etern in eternal paradise is because of that great and holy sacrifice. Father, we know that that cost much, but Father, we know that your love was unbelievable in giving to us the avenue that we have to, be, to have our sins washed away, Father, to once again stand in your presence in a way, Father, that we can live eternally with you. Father, we know that there are times when we do things that aren't according to your will. And we're so thankful, Father, that your sacrifice of your son and the blood that was shed gives us that avenue of forgiveness. We're so sorry, Father, that our sins required this, but we're so thankful, Father, that your love enabled it. Father, be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. It's in Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so, that he, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that, at the same, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, last week uh, we looked at some of the challenges that uh, we meet with our faith, things that, that can rock our faith, test our faith. And one of the things that can challenge our faith are our questions that we have. Some of the more difficult questions and left unanswered, those questions can lead to further questions, to further doubts. It can really shipwreck our faith if we don't provide the right solid, firm answers to those questions. And so today I want to answer one of those questions. I wanted to use our, our nine o'clock service and to answer a common question that a lot of people ask. And that is, how can I know the Bible is God's words? I mean, how, how do we know the book that you hold in your hands actually is God's inspired word, that it came from God itself? Because let's be honest, if we can't answer this question, if, if we don't know the answer to this question or can't provide the answer to this question, none of this matters. None of this matters. Because without the Bible, we don't have Jesus. We don't have the cross or the resurrection. We don't have the church. Really, we don't have anything that we hold to except for the fact that there might be a divine being who created the world, but we don't know who he is and we don't know what he wants. And so the foundation of all that we believe and all that we do hinges upon our ability to answer this question. And let me just give a premise because I'm looking, it's 927. There have been books upon books upon books written on this subject, and I don't intend to answer every single question related to this subject, nor do I intend to provide every single evidence that could be out there for the Bible. I want to give you what I believe are some of the most compelling evidences to answer this question, and then we'll end talking about some things related to what this has to do with us. 
I just say that to say, if, if you go into looking to answer this question, you're going to find more. The more you dig, the more you research, the more, the more answers and evidences you're going to find. I want to give you today what I believe are some of the most powerful evidences there are to prove the answer to this question. Let's just get right started with it. How can I know the Bible is God's words? We need to start with the understanding that the Bible itself claims to be God's words. And so you have your Bibles open. Second Timothy chapter three, you can read it in your text or on the screen. Paul says it this way, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Your translation, if you use the ESV, may see breathe out from God. It comes from God. So the very words Paul says that you were reading, that we have given to you, know that they come not from man, but they come from God. If you remember the, the prophets of the Old Testament, one of the patterns of the prophets is that they would announce their message as if it came from the Lord. And so, for instance, the book of Hosea 1 and verse 1, it says, the word of the Lord which came to Hosea. The very beginning of his message says, this is not my stuff, it's not my words. These come from God. Or as God says to Jeremiah, the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth. The message you're gonna preach, the message you're giving to the people, it's not what you think they need to hear. I'm telling you, I'm giving you the words, you're gonna deliver it to them. And that's what Paul would say. Paul would say in the book of 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, notice the words in yellow. I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now here he's talking about the context of the Lord's Supper and all the, the issues with the Lord's Supper, but you at least just notice what he's saying. The things I'm gonna tell you, you need to change. The, the, the things I'm gonna tell you that you need to work on, these are not Paul's thoughts, these are Jesus himself. These are the words of God. In fact, when he wrote to the churches in Galatia, he made the point, he says, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel, the good news, which was preached by me, it's not according to man. It wasn't given by man. It wasn't come up by man. It's not man's words. He says, I, I neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. These words are God's words. Let me give you one more. Maybe 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive from us the word of God's message, you accepted it, not as the words of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Do you kind of catch the theme here? Over and over and over again, these words say, these aren't man's ideas. This wasn't the wisest words for the prophets at the time. These words come from God. Now, this is important because if we did not have this, if we didn't have these statements and all we had was just words on the page, we might assume, well, maybe they were words of a prophet. Maybe they did come from, from the wisest men or the kings or the leaders at, at this time. Now, is this enough to prove that the Bible does come from God? No, no, it's not. In fact, God giving us these statements that the message comes from him, it's not evidence he's providing us. What he's providing us is a responsibility to test and to weigh the words. In other words, when he says that these words come from God, the burden then is on us to test and to weigh and to examine the evidence to see if really this does come from God. And so that's where we look to this one. I believe the most compelling evidence that the Bible comes from God it's a proof of prophecy. What the Bible is able to foretell long in the future, and it all was able to come true. You know, Bible prophecy is not like, like fortune cookie prophecy. I got a fortune cookie once that says, you will be hungry again. I said, how did it know? It's amazing. You ever gotten something like that? You will have good luck in the future. Whew, man, they are some wise prophets. It's, no, no, it's really, that's really general. That's really broad. That's not Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is not some kind of generic statement. Good news will happen in the future. Something positive will happen to Israel. No, Bible prophecy was laser focused. It talked about specific people, specific places, specific events, specific times, and it all was fulfilled with specific accuracy. So a lot we could point here, a lot of ways we could show this to be true. I wanna show you one today. I have this chart, and I don't intend for you to be able to read this unless you want to strain your eyes. Actually, I don't even think you could. I can't even read it from this close. It's not the point. I'm gonna, you're going to get this tomorrow in an email with the next steps. You will find charts a lot like this if you just Google fulfilled prophecies. I think this one I Googled uh, fulfilled messianic prophecies. A lot of charts like these. But what I like about charts similar to these is that on one hand, you will have the Old Testament prophecy 
In the middle might describe what it is that's being prophesied. And then on the right hand, you'll have the New Testament fulfillment. I want you just for a minute, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the whole chart. It's what I have here. I just want you to listen for a minute and think logically, logically with me. Can you do it for a minute? Just, just logically walk it through. What are the odds that hundreds of years before it took place, a prophet could tell how a child miraculously was gonna be born from a virgin and that he would know the exact name the child would be named, Emmanuel, and it came true. And what are the odds that hundreds of years before it took place, a prophet could write down exactly where it was that this child was gonna be born, the Messiah, and it wasn't in Jerusalem, the capital of God's people, it wasn't in the very city where the temple dwelt, but as Micah prophesied, it was in the small, almost forgotten town of Bethlehem. Who would know that? What are the odds of that? What are the odds when this child would grow? When Jesus began to do his work of all the miracles Jesus did, because you know there's a lot of things he didn't do, okay? He didn't fly, okay? He didn't shoot lasers out of his eyes. There's a lot of things he did not do. Of all the miracles he did, he specifically did the miracles that Isaiah would lay out in Isaiah chapter 35 that he would let the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf would hear. The exact same miracles Jesus performed. What are the odds of that? Well, what are the odds that when Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem for his final journey to the cross and he goes to Jerusalem, do you remember how he went? He didn't walk to Jerusalem. He didn't take a chariot. He didn't ride in a cart. Of all things, he rode on a donkey and not just a donkey, a young donkey, a colt, specifically fulfilling what Zechariah said that he would enter in riding on a colt. Or maybe if you just took a moment, there's many like this, his death. Brethren, what are the odds that Jesus would be betrayed of all people, not by, not by a priest, not by a Pharisee, but he would be betrayed by a close friend fulfilling Psalm 41. And what are the odds that when Judas betrayed Jesus, when he was paid for his betrayal of all the things they could have paid him, Of all the amounts of money they could have paid him, they chose to pay him specifically 30 pieces of silver, fulfilling what was said in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, that he was weighed out for his wages 30 pieces of silver. What are the odds of that? What are the odds that when Jesus was taken away, you start at the night in the garden, and you remember there's all those soldiers there, and they all have their swords, Peter's slinging his sword, trying to kill. What are the odds he wasn't killed there in the garden? What are the odds when he stands before the Sanhedrin, they didn't just take him out silently and stone him. They've been trying to do it the whole time. What are the odds when he stands before Pilate and then Herod and then Pilate again, they don't just kill him right there on the spot. I mean, you look at Acts 12, Herod has no problem killing James the apostle with the sword. Why didn't he just kill Jesus right there with the sword? What are the odds that the way that Jesus meets his end and meets his death is exactly what Isaiah says in Isaiah 53. Not just that he's crucified, but that Pilate thinking, I'm gonna calm down this crowd shouting crucify, so I'm gonna go have him scourged and maybe that'll satisfy him. But the scourging is not enough and he has to be pierced. And that scourging and that piercing is specifically laid out in Isaiah 53 and verse five. What are the odds of that? What are the odds that when Jesus was crucified, there's two other men who was crucified that same day, fulfilling what was said in Isaiah 53 and verse 12, that he was numbered among the transgressors. What are the odds that when, when time was rapidly approaching and the Sabbath was coming and those guards, remember, they had to get done, they had to get the bodies down. So remember what they did? They went to the thieves and they broke the legs. Well, why, did they, why didn't they break Jesus' legs? What are the odds that instead of just breaking his legs, they look at him and they they, they determine his condition and then they pierce him with a spear, fulfilling two prophecies. One, what the psalmist says, and that one bone of his body would be broken. But secondly, what uh, what Zechariah fulfilled, that the son shall be pierced through. And what are the odds, brethren, that when Jesus is finally killed, They don't just take down his body and cast it into the pile of dead corpses of the poor and destitute of the land, but no, there's one who arises and says his body will be mine and that grave is not a pauper's hole, but it is a rich man's tomb, fulfilling what is said in the end of Isaiah 53. What are the odds? You know what the odds are? 
The odds of winning the lottery are one and 259 million. In other words, ain't gonna happen. But the odds of a man fulfilling just eight, a prophecy similar to Jesus is one in 100 quadrillion. That's 10 to the 17th, one in 100 quadrillion. Does that impress you? But we're in Texas. Let's make it bigger, ready? Because we like things big. Can you imagine with me? State of Texas, you've been across Texas. I mean, it takes like a week to cross Texas, huge. Imagine scattering 100 quadrillion quarters over all of Texas. It covers the entire state, 100 quadrillion quarters. In fact, someone estimated if you spread 100 quadrillion Texas, uh, quarters on Texas, it would cover about to about a foot over the whole state. And so you cover the state in all these quarters and then we randomly pick one quarter and we draw a red X on it and we cast it back in and scatter all the quarters up. And then we get a man and we blindfold him and we turn him loose. And he's walking blindfolded through Texas, through all these quarters. He decides to stop randomly, bend down and pick up one quarter. And it happens to be the quarter that has the red X. That is one in 100 quadrillion. And that's the odds if a man fulfills eight of prophecies similar to Jesus and Jesus fulfilled over 300. What does that tell you? It's not that this is improbable. This is impossible. These things cannot happen unless they are the work and the product of a master author, of a divine hand. What more could be compelling to provide for us the evidence? These have to be God's words. Now, when we're looking at this subject, something else I'd like to point to is the proof of archeology. span Archaeology doesn't prove that the Bible is God's word, but what it does is it helps validate the things we find in God's word. You know what I like about archaeology is that the secular mind thinks the more we dig and the more we find, we're just going to prove the Bible's all just a bunch of myths. But the reality is the more we dig and the more we find, it just keeps on supporting everything we find in the Bible. And so for instance, here's a couple of things we found that I think are fascinating. The Tell Dan Steel. A steel is a historical monument, a stone inscribed on which would be a moment in, in history's past. On this particular steel, we find mentioned the nation of Israel under the reign of its King David. Well, we know who David is. Four books of the Old Testament are, are attributed to David. And so here is a historical monument that mentions David as the king of Israel. There's a Misha steel. Misha was the king of Moab. A steel, particular steel mentions a, a battle, a conflict between the Moabites and the Israelites. And it goes into detail about this conflict. You know where else we read about that conflict? Second Kings chapter three. This is a historical stone that retells what we already have in the Bible in second Kings chapter three just a historical perspective on that battle. There's the Nabonidus cylinder. Nabonidus was the king of the Babylonians. And in this, in this steel, in this, in this writing on this stone, it mentions Belshazzar, the king of, of Babylon. We know about him and read about him in the book of Daniel. We have found King Hezekiah's seal. Yes, King Hezekiah. And so the official documents that he would write, the official decrees that he would stamp his signature in into the wax, that would be his signet, that is his seal. And then two or three years ago, I forgot the date, two or three years ago, we found the prophet Isaiah, his seal. Remember Isaiah came from a, from a royal and a noble background. And it's been found, I think two years ago that we found his signet. Now, does this prove the Bible is God's word? No, no, but again, what it helps validate is that the people we read about and the places we read about and the events we read about actually happened. They actually took place. Fascinating findings. Then here's one more, last one. And that's a proof of manuscripts. What manuscripts help us with is how do we know the book in our laps is actually the same words? Because we know that when the word was originally given, written down by Moses, whoever, whoever else authored it, it was written and then the priests and the scribes would take that writing and then they would copy it. And then another priest and scribe would copy the copy. And another one would copy that copy and then copy, 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 copy. Well, how do we know it's not like this long game of telephone where it starts with this message, but then along the way, it kind of gets messed up until the very end and it's completely wrong. How do we know? How do we know that the words we have in our book today haven't been changed along the way? That they are the exact words. And that's where manuscripts come into play. Manuscripts are the copies of the original. And so when you look at our, at our New Testament, 
you're not gonna be able to read that very well, but if you look to the right of the screen, the largest yellow circle on the right side of the screen, that is Homer right there. Any of you read the, the Odyssey or the Iliad from Homer? No, they're good books. Y'all need to read a little more. You got some time with COVID, go read the Odyssey and the Iliad. Homer, Homer, we have 643 mans- manuscripts or uh, copies of his writings, 643 King Caesar, we have 10. Aristotle, if you've heard of Aristotle, we have about 50, 49. Do you see this massive sun over here to the left? We have 24,000 copies of the New Testament. Now think of that, think of that. How many people today are questioning the validity of the Odyssey? No, it's just, you, you can't trust it. And we only have 643. And yet the New Testament over 24,000 manuscripts to weigh, to measure, to look, and to, and, and to consider against. With Homer, the earliest copy we have is 500 years after it was written. And so the oldest copy, or you might consider the earliest copy, 500 years after it was originally written. The New Testament, we have copies that date within or shortly after the first century. In fact, four years ago, we found the oldest or earliest, I'm not sure how to say that. We, we found at that time, the closest written date to the book of Mark. It was a copy of Mark found on the back of a mummy mask of all things. Someone thought it was trash and they used it as this mask for someone who has died. Well, we found it and it dates within them around 150 AD. Right? And so you look at all these copies, you look at all these manuscripts and you know what's found? Are there variations? Sure, sure, spelling changes. Majority of them are spelling or the way they they kind of put the words. But within all those 24,000, you know what has not changed? The message. There are no contradictions. The message has remained the same. Ah, but that's the New Testament. You can't trust that Old Testament. That's older than dirt. Only Ricky was there when it was written. You can't trust it. You can't trust that Old Testament. Well, I think one of the greatest findings of, of this past generation, I forget it was 1946 or 1947, but this kid was out throwing rocks out by the Dead Sea. And as he was throwing rocks, he heard a crash. And so he ran to check and see what he hit. And sure enough, in one of those caves, because around the Dead Sea are all these different caves and crevices, inside of one of those caves were these ancient jars containing what we call today the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you seen it before? It's come through town a couple of times. You know why it's so important? Before we found this, 1940s, b- before we found this, the oldest copy we had of the Old Testament was called the Masoretic Text. And it dated to around, around 900 AD. The Dead Sea Scroll dates to 100 BC. Over a thousand years difference between the two copies. And so they looked. Looked at every word. What's changed in a thousand years? And you know what changed? There was some spelling, right? Some spelling was off. The message remained the same. No contradictions. What's that mean? Well, that you and I can trust that God, the heaven, the the, the author of this, God of heaven, the author of this book, faithfully translated and passed along his words so that even here today, we can know for certain his will. No question. We can have confidence the words in our laps are indeed the words that were written and given long ago. All right, well, so what? So maybe it is. Maybe these are God's words. Maybe these were given by the Lord. So what? What's the big deal? You know, I, I think and initially we can realize that it's one thing to own a Bible or to know about the Bible it's another thing entirely to read it, to understand it, to, to know it, and as God would intend us to do, to, to live it. I was reading this week that this year, 2020, is considered by some as the year of the Bible. That's what this year is called, the year of the Bible. So the person who founded this movement said that they're bringing together resources to help believers and non-believers alike to engage with the Bible like never before. This person said that the Bible is the most influential and misunderstood book in history and that this, move, this movement would simply ask people to look to the Bible for yourself. And what if this was your year to be inspired? 
The website that they have around this says that it was a historic collaboration of organizations, people, artists, musicians, designers, politicians, groups from almost every walk of life that are collectively declaring 2020 to be the year of the Bible. So at least at face value, if you just see through all the, all the, the weeds here, it's an incentive of a group of people to try and get people back to the book, read the book, study the Bible, because there's something that this movement understands. If you get through all the weeds, all the politics, all the show behind it all, there's something they understand, and that is that there is an immense value, incomparable, if you just get these words into your life. But that's the problem. That's the problem, isn't it? I think a lot of people will admit it's really appealing to know the Bible. It would seem really appealing to know this book and to know it well, to be able to quote it, to be able to say that I, I, I know this forwards and backwards, even those obscure books. It would be really appealing to say that I have a solid foundation of understanding of what the Bible teaches. But the problem is that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a dedicated concentration to give your time and your effort to know these words. And so it's a lot easier to take a picture of a Bible. It's a lot easier to wave a Bible in front of a church or a steeple. It's a lot easier simply just to own a Bible. It's a lot easier to boast about being biblically minded than it is to open the book and to read it and to study it and know it. It's said that Mark Twain once heard a, a shrewd and vile businessman was, was boasting that he was gonna go to, to the Holy Lands and he was gonna go climb Mount Sinai and he was gonna read the 10 commandments and Mark Twain said, I have a better idea. Why don't you stay home and live it? Isn't that it? It's one thing to own a Bible, but to disregard its message, to, to live contrary to the way that it points, to disrespect the author altogether misses the point completely. I heard a story about, about parents who, who bought their, their high school grad a Bible and they left a note on the Bible that said, we hope you'll read these pages. You will find that they are extremely valuable. Well, he went off to college and about a weekend, he says, mom and dad, I need some money. And they said, why don't you read John 3, 16? And so the next day he called me and said, I, I read the verse, I still need some money. And he said, well, why don't you read, why don't you read Philippians 4, 13? The next day he called, he said, look, I've, I've read your verses. I just, I need money is what I need. And the dad says, I know you've not read those verses because I placed a hundred dollar bill next to those verses. And had you read the verses, you would have had the money you're looking for. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea or not. You know that in our Bibles, we're not gonna have a hundred dollar bill sticking out. And yet, what was it that the psalmist said in Psalm 19? More desirable than gold, a much fine gold, sweeter than the honeycomb. The incentive to read God's word is not merely the, the passing values of what it can do to get us through, through life here. The value is this immeasurable benefit that can come from those who give their lives to God's word. And so I just wanna give you five things, five reasons to read the Bible. We're gonna go through them fast. I all found here in this passage I asked you to open to in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Five reasons we ought to read our Bible. No, you're not gonna find a hundred dollar bill sticking out, but you're gonna find something far more valuable, far more lasting, lasting in spiritual and eternal worth if we give our time and attention to God's word. So here's five reasons. Number one, the Bible shows you what is right. It's profitable for teaching. Your verse may read for doctrine. It is able to show us exactly what is true. And I'm gonna tell you in a world like today, the idea of actual, genuine, non-flawed truth, that's really appealing. You know, as, as uh, Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, that we can know the will of the Lord or as he would say in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. It's not that the irony of our time, brethren. We are drowning in information and yet we're starving for truth. Have you found that? Everywhere on every subject, there is an expert who has written a five page article and yet no one knows the truth. No one understands what the truth is. But God says in his word, when you read these words, what you will find is not merely the opinion of a man or a prophet. You're finding the true, genuine, authentic words of God, words that will set you free. And so it's true about life. 
What's true about morals and ethics? What's true about the church and its purpose and its work? What's true about our relationships with one another and in our homes and in our marriages and with our brothers and with the, and with the country? It's true. The Bible is able to show you the right way, what is genuinely right. But then on the other side of that, the Bible is able to, to show you what is wrong because it says it's able to, to be profitable for reproof. That's the, the ability to sharpen and point and penetrate. That is the ability to correct. That is the ability to show another's faults. That's the problem with our culture today is no one wants to be wrong. Everyone is right. And so you can't tell another person that they are wrong, but God's word certainly says there's some things that are wrong. Stealing is wrong. Lying is wrong. Cheating is wrong. Prejudice is wrong. Hating is wrong. Greed is wrong. And on and on we can go. The point is God did not give his word merely to be the butter knife which spreads and smooths over all of our faults. Look what it said here in Hebrews 4 and verse 12. The word of God is living and active and what? Sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as a division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If we're reading the word of God like a butter knife and I'm trying to find passages to justify the way I'm living, I'm not using it the way God gave it. The word of God is not a butter knife. The word of God is a sharp penetrating blade of the spirit intended to pierce and cut through the heart. And it hurts and it wounds. I mean, how many of you have said, boy, that really stepped on my toes today. That's the point. That's the point. The scripture is meant to show us the areas of our life that are so very contrary to God and his way. It shows us what is wrong. But then as Paul would go on, it shows us how to get right. That's the idea of correction, the teaching, the help the pointing in the right direction as those in Acts 2. As they felt that piercing of the heart, as Peter was preaching his sermon, they, they asked the question, what can we do? And he gave them the right answer. You, you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, I, I was thinking about this from, from yesterday. You know, yesterday we as the country collectively celebrated the independence, the history, the, the founding of our country. The idea of, the, of liberty, that the concept of liberty or independence, I think is fascinating, of freedom. You know, in, in our minds, we think freedom is the ability to do whatever it is I want to do. That's freedom. And I guess that would be true if the things we wanted to do were the right things. Because here's the thing. There are some choices I may make out of what I might think is liberty that would keep me from making other choices in my life. In other words, it would steal me from other liberties. Let me give you an example. We love Bluebell. I love Bluebell. I could eat Bluebell all day long, every meal. That's my liberty, right? I, could, I get to do what I wanna do. Well, if I chose only to eat Bluebell ice cream, while I might feel like I had the freedom to do so, as my waist expanded, and my health declined, it would keep me from other freedoms and choices I would get to do in this life. I say, well, I make my money. I have a paycheck. I can buy what I want to buy. So I can go on Amazon and get that Amazon Prime discount and I can buy and buy, buy and buy, buy and swipe, 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 swipe. And that's how some people live. It's my freedom. It's my liberty. And you can do so. You can do that, but you end up in your liberty and you're buying and buying and buying and spending. You end up being a slave to your debtors. Or in a blue ball, I'm a slave to my health. Or in a sexual exploitation, I'm a slave. I'm a slave to a relationship or shame. Or in the alcohol or in the drugs, I'm a slave to the substance. You see, Jesus said it long ago. He says, those who choose to sin, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is choosing, pursuing the wrong things. I think all of us know that so well that if we choose to pursue the wrong things in life, those things can end up enslaving us. And that's why he would say, if, if you accept it, if you accept my words as truth, there is something so very liberating, freeing in those truths. Because when you give your life to Jesus and you abide in Christ, the things you pursue, the things you desire change. And you end up pursuing the things that don't lead to death, they lead to life. And that's the idea here of this getting right, this correction. Your whole life is changing. Because the friends you used to pursue, you're choosing, you're choosing different friends. 
And the habits you used to build, you're, you're building new habits. And the things you used to find entertaining, the things you used to find fulfilling in your life, you're, you're choosing a different system, a different value. That's this idea. God is reworking, retraining, reteaching us from the inside out. And that's the idea. It's a process that takes time. The Bible helps you stay right because it says this training in righteousness, continuing to teach, continuing to mold, continuing to change, ever changing, ever growing, ever maturing on our journey back home to where ultimately the Bible will equip us along God's way as we day by day are formed into the image of Christ that we could be prepared, equipped, thoroughly furnished, completely satisfied, fully able to do all that God expects us to do, equipped for every good work, that we're able to take the strength and the time and the opportunities that God lays before us and to use our strength and our times and our talents, not for our good, but for the glory of God. D.L. Moody once said that God did not give the Bible simply to make us smarter sinners. And I think that's a good quote. The purpose of God's word, brethren, it's not just that we get a lot of information we get the most of. The purpose of God's word is information that results in transformation. A people who take these words and go out and live it in our lives. And that's what the word of God does. It helps us be the people God has called us to be, not to know the things that God knows, but to live the way that God lives. That's the right and that's the purpose. Let me ask you something. What would it mean to you if God spoke to you, God spoke to you, to you, God spoke to you. And in speaking to you, he told you everything that he likes, everything that pleases him, everything, everything that warms his heart and brings him joy. And in the same time tells you the things he doesn't like. What if he told you everything that's happened? He, he, he gave you a glimpse of what happened before you were of life before you, of life long ago, and he gave you a picture. He gave you a history lesson of how the world began, but then went far in the other direction and gave you a glimpse of what's to come. What if he told you and sat down and communicated to you, this is, this is what's coming. You can't see it yet. In fact, I'm not telling you when, but I'm gonna tell you how it all is gonna end. How close would you pay attention to those words? How clued in would you be to that voice speaking to you? How quick would you be to write down everything that he was saying so you wouldn't miss a beat, so you wouldn't miss one moment? Because in our hands and in our laps, while God is speaking to the world and the creator is communicating to his creation, brethren, he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. He's telling you what has been. He's telling you what is to come. And he's trying to allow these ancient words, these precious words to be the words that shape and mold and guide us on our journey home. Praise God today and thank him for his amazing and incredible words. Thank you for listening so well today. If you've come here this morning and you're not in a right relationship with God, we need to change that. And you can do so. You can do so. If you've been walking away from God and, and not where you ought to be, you, you here today, even here in the pew or at home, can make the changes in your life and ask for forgiveness and continue to walk on that right path. But if you've, if you've come here today or if you're, if you're tuned to things going on today and you need some help and someone to pray for you, you just, you just have to reach out and ask. And there's a family of believers both here and, and, and afar that would love to pray for you and help you and walk with you as you continue on, on your journey home. So if we can help you today, be an encouragement to you, pray for you, maybe help you start your journey, we'd love to do so. If we can do so, let's do it right now as we stand and as we sing.
Shall we pray? Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this time that we've had to open up your word and to study from it and to once again see that your word is infallible, is unchanging, and is everlasting. It's such a comfort to us in this world that is constantly changing that your word and your message and your truth has remained unchanged since you gave it to us. We pray to Lord that you will continue to be with all the, the members here and to keep everybody safe and healthy. We pray to Lord that you'll be with us as we go into this week, that we will continue to let our light shine no matter what our circumstances are. And above all, Lord, we say thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our closing song will be Firm Foundation. <laughs> 